Welcome back to the second period of the 15th annual Northampton High School Poetry Slam. If you were here, second period, scream. So we, during lunch, our lunch break, somebody brought us that we actually, the slam is actually on the cover of the Gazette today for our 15th anniversary, which is really cool. We also want to give it up to everybody who has performed and everybody who wills, will perform today. Uh, we also have another bit of good news. Our um, generous poets have arrived from Hampshire College. So we wanted to thank them for being here. Jarrell Watkins, uh, Sophia Koss, and Danielle Peterson. Peterson. We have our new, uh, another MC joining us this period, and next is Asher Griska. <laughs> and, and also we're gonna start off with a little treat for you, uh, especially for the faculty here. We've got Robin Barber, who is our esteemed former colleague, uh, a poet, Renaissance man, does all sorts of things, and he's gonna come up here and give us a poem to get us started. So give him a hand. Robin Barber. I retired in 2006, so it's going to be six full years in June. And uh, I miss this place. I miss the energy. I'm going to read a poem called Why I, like, Why I Write. Poetry, why I write poetry. <clears throat> Do I write poetry? I am not certain that what I write deserves the name. We need to know what we mean by a word. And when I say poetry, what I mean is the emotion felt by the listener when they hear the poem. Poetry is a shape-shifting medium. It can appear to us as a song with rhymes, with formal structure, or as three quiet lines, or as pages of rambling verse. But nothing about the way a poem looks can make it poetry. Only when a listener's heart feels that deep pull, and a listener's body responds with grief or joy, can we say that a poem has been made? A fellow MC doing his poem now. Ky we have another MC doing a poem. Kyle, Coyote, Who Man? I don't care if you're Jewish or Muslim, black, white, or blue. You could see through the media if you worship Cthulhu. The blueprint, battle plan, blatant oppression, carved out, created war machine, burning Torah for fuel, killing, curing the promised land of disease called Allah. Authority is myth, willpower a legend, boldness a brazen idea to a hazen media. Bomb goes off, bullet gets fired. God damn, won't these terrorists ever get tired? Yes, they are tired and weak, wounded, dying, starving and holding their children and crying. The ruins of a home turns a boy to a man, apathy to bone, bone to gun, gun to gone. Hackenkreuz, David Starr, a symbol never stopped a man from going too far, certainly never stopped and opened to our eyes. Time to take a step back, reassess and re-sympathize. Look into the television and see all the lies. Anti-Palestine or you're anti-Semitic. 
bigot, bastard, you don't know what they went through. Christians to lions, Jews at a flu, crusades, pogroms, inquisition, auto de fe. Christianity's turn ran out yesterday. Palestine, Palestine. Can't we just make peace in Palestine? This land of supposed culture breeding Philistine to both sides. Wipe away all sides, wipe away the truth. Please see through the lies. The colors of flags are merely meant to hypnotize. So stop and think, stop and speak. Before in the rubble of an old destroyed home, child in his arms, another man grows weak. Thank you. Next up is Lily Ruderman. My best friend lives on a cloud. In the morning, she wakes up surrounded by baby animals. She gets a ride to her school on her pink Pegasus. School sits in the middle of a colorful rainbow surrounded by fluffy white sheep clouds. She doesn't have math class or physical education. The teachers are friendly dragons painted with sparkly scales. I know this because she told me. First class of the day, she learns to make the soft on the inside, crunchy on the rim chocolate chip cookies that are so good your fingers grab for more and more, burning from the hot sweetness. She eats four. Class two, building Barbie's dream home. She models it after her own home. Pink curtains, purple walls, magenta carpeting over smooth hardwood floors, a giant canopy bed and castle turrets, a house fit for the spoiled royalty watching over the world in their plastic clothes. It looks exactly like hers. She sent me a picture. Next class. She goes down the hall, followed by a cloud of sparkles and fake friends smiling their fake smiles, voices hushed. This class is Hollywood movies. As usual, she is a star. The teacher tells her how wonderful she is and how pretty she is. And please, won't she consider a career in the acting field? Please, oh pretty, pretty, please. She says maybe and keeps smiling, smiling her white teeth at her fans. The camera takes in everything. The curtain of red curls framing her high cheekbones. Flawless, creamy white skin without a single blemish, freckle molar zip. She walks to lunch surrounded by people. The boy to her right carries her books. The boy on the left carries her jacket. Neither are dating her, but both love her. And she knows it. Everyone loves her. She is a princess living in a magical diamond world. Now my life is different. I don't even bother telling her about it. I get dragged out of bed and walk in a daze through my morning. Brush teeth, shower, get dressed, eat breakfast. Day by day is the same ordeal. I have to go to school, but my school is not in a cloud. It is not taught by friendly dragons. It sits on a harsh block of concrete. The faculty have no patience for the lousy teens that walk their halls. But still, every day the school welcomes me in. I drive up in my mom's car, not a flying horse. I walk into the building and it says, hello. It welcomes me with open arms. I go to my classes. For once, I think I like algebra and English and history and everything. Everything is so wonderful. And my gaze is not clouded by the pink and the glitter. I am weird and I am flawed, but I am me. And that is better than anything else I could be. And for just a few moments, I am thankful that I am not my best friend, my best friend who lives on a cloud. All right, this just in. The people who are uh, judging the poems, you need to write very thickly so we can see the numbers. Um, anyhow, the next poet up is Miles Johnson, so enjoy. <laughs> Miles, I love you. Uh, my poem is called School. Going to bed at 11 or later, waking up at 6.30, no later, packing a fat lunch, always excited to munch, so tired when I'm on my way, hoping I will have a good day. School is sometimes very fun, labs in chemistry, home ec, making buns. <laughs> but sometimes it is very boring, usually I feel like snoring, always looking forward to the end of the day as I watch the clock ticking away.
And next up is Nadine Harris. All right. <laughs> How y'all doing today? What's up? <laughs> All right. I called this poem, Get Over It. <clears throat> I've struggled, I've thrived, every day in my life just to stay alive. But you wouldn't know that just by looking at me, right? Am I uptight, am I polite, am I funny, am I shy? You wouldn't know, so to this day, I wonder why. Why judge me, based on my clothes, my hair, my face, my race? You can't judge a book by its cover, because it won't tell you the words written on its pages. Everyone knows that, or so I thought. All the challenges and struggles that I've faced, no one has a clue but if they only knew before they judged. With just one glance, everyone thinks they have they all, they, everybody thinks they have you all figured out. Wrong. Mom drunk every day. Dad walked out when I was five. Yeah, it was hard and left pretty big scars, but those scars healed and were forgotten. I didn't just sit there and cry. What's the point? All you can do is wave goodbye. Move on, stay strong. People stabbed, shot down right before my eyes. Yeah, you might be surprised at how well I've disguised my past in my pain, but pain only exists if you let it. All my life, people have been trying to knock me down, down to my knees, beat me so hard to the point where I feel hopeless, scared, alone. Am I doing something wrong? Why don't they like me? Why can't they just accept me for who I am and who I'm always gonna be? But wait, who are you to ask me to change? How I act, how I dress? Yeah, I sag my pants and rock snapbacks, but that's just my swag. And not to brag, but I think I look pretty good for a poor girl from the hood. I can guarantee my life has been twice as hard as yours, but that, that doesn't matter. You can either dwell on it or learn from it, and I decided to learn and grow. So as I stayed there, my knees on the ground with nobody else around to help me back up, everybody surrounding me, attacking me with these words, beating me down, doing everything possible to make me frown. I was broken. Actually, no, not broken, never broken. Nobody will ever break me. I am who I am, and I refuse to change for anyone. What people think is irrelevant, yeah, you might call it brilliant how I've made myself resilient. I'm deaf to those poisonous words and blind to the people who say them. I am a tree standing strong, sturdy, impenetrable. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. So do me and yourself a favor, and don't waste any time trying to find ways to get in my mind and blind me from seeing that I'm perfect just the way I am, so get over it. Next poet, Jimmy Murphy. Hello. Okay, so I've got a political poem that's kind of dark. All right. I'm sorry for the political corruption of our great nation that fills our mind with filth and lies. I was 11, you see, only 11. I'm sorry that life is so difficult for you, that you must rummage through the ambiguities of society without the comfort of your mother's soothing. You see, I was 11, only 11. I am not 11 anymore, and I am not sorry. You who have opened my mind to the dark of days, you who thrust me from nirvana into a pitiful existence, I am not sorry. You who have caused, I am not sorry, the change in me, for the change in you. You who have caused me to become a thinker. The hard eyes of conservatism pop out of my sockets and the eyes of a giver of an old coot sink through my skull. You who have changed me, you who have alluded to the true pleasures of existence and the folly of men. I am not sorry. I'm not sorry for this existence, nor was I sorry for my previous. I am sorry for those who suffer those who I made suffer, and those who discard the so themselves from this existence entirely due to men like me. Thank you.
There's some poetry I can get behind. All right, next up is Emma Landsman. Crush. The scent always lingers when. You pass by in the hall. You're the picture on my wall. You stand so tall. I'm about to fall. I adore your smile. It's greater than the Nile. Your number I dial. You speak without guile. When we embrace, you kiss my face. Going at a steady pace. I know I'm in the right place. When we stand, you hold my hand. I'm in another land like a boy band. I'm your biggest fan, riding in your van, knowing you're my man with cool Ray-Bans. We already coo, so there's no need to woo. Together, we are two, and I love you. The scent always lingers when. The next poet is Jonathan Latender. <laughs> it was July 4th, 2025 the 249th year that America celebrated its Independence Day. But we weren't celebrating it in any old fashion. I was barely able to see with all the blood and the sweat that was running down my face. And with a gunshot wound in my left leg, I could barely walk. But with men and women dying around every corner, I knew I only had one choice, and that was to fight. Because to be able to win a war, you have to defend your country with heart in passion, not sit around twiddling your thumbs and doing nothing to help the enemy win. God dang it, this is a war, and I will fight day and night to win. And if I don't, and if I don't succeed, at least I can say that I've given it my all. All right, so our next poet is Christina Strauss-Kennedy. Ooh. Hi, Toy, I love you. <laughs> That's my brother, by the way. Um, Is this how it feels to not have a mother? She asked me between the tears clinging to my shirt. Her own mother had just been cut down from the rafters. Is this how it feels to not have a mother? I wanted to rip the words out of her mouth and beat them into the ground. I wanted to silence them. Her words heavy on my mind, I became the desperate one. It was my life being cut down from the rafters. It was my heart bleeding in the dirt. The pain beat like the South African drums, louder and louder, my whole body shaking. The drums beat so hard, cuts are opened wide, gaping mouths on my wrists, spitting blood, flowing rivers down wrists to the tips of reaching fingers, my pain flowed. I grew weak from the fight to survive. There was never a hand in the darkness to hold mine. There was never a love that woke me with kisses and lay me to rest with whispers like butterflies. No one ever gave me wings to fly. 
So I grew up learning how to paint rainbows black and how to weave pain into tapestries. I try to keep myself from the rafters by bleeding my words onto paper, words that leave bruises on my skin, soft blue and black maps of yesterday. People read me like a poorly written book. Don't you know how it feels to wake up one day alone and cold and unintentionally make yourself believe that the world isn't real? Don't you know how it feels to drown in nothing, to scream in silence and to love in blood, to hunger hurt because, because it is the only way for people to see you, to feel you? I am the puzzle piece being forced into the wrong puzzle. My sides broken, bent, and torn to make me fit. My mouth is taped shut. I'm trapped in my own cage, but I am not discarded and forgotten. And isn't that something to be thankful for? Isn't that good enough to live, to breathe? This isn't fair, she cried. It isn't fair that today when the sky should be crying like us, it is smiling. Mocking our pain, make it stop, she cried. And I wanted to. Holding her, I let words she needed to hear slip through my lips. I realized that no matter how hard I tried, I was nothing. So I cried with her, harboring my pain beside hers. Thank you. Real talk. <laughs> Next up, Alyssa Tibble. Blinded by the sight of his eyes, the eyes that haunt my dreams, the ones that make me fall down to my knees and break the world around me, fade into a black abyss. The eyes that take my breath away with a silent glance, the dark blue eyes that pierce my heart with a soft cold stare, that see right through my soul. Eyes that are like windows to your thoughts that dance around those wild dark blue eyes that I cannot tame for they are the eyes I fell for. That was beautiful, and I think we all know how that feels sometimes. Next up is Raven Serena. Hi. Sorry to say my poem isn't as deep as everyone else's. When I was a little kid, I played a lot of Pokemon. I may not have been very good at it, but it was something I enjoyed. Now that I'm older, I've realized something very important about life. We're all Pokemon. <laughs> at level five, a Pokemon prepares for their journey, just as we did in kindergarten. Pokemon then travel the land, getting all eight of their region's badges. We did the same, but our badges were grades. Once we're strong enough, or once they're strong enough, Pokemon go against the Elite Four, some of the toughest trainers they're ever going to face. We've done the same because our Elite Four is high school, the hardest years of our life. When a Pokemon finishes, they can go against the champion. The champion is their final hurdle, the final thing they need to prove themselves, and that's the same thing college is for us. Another beautiful thing about Pokemon is they evolve on their travels, and once again, we have done the same. Just like them, we've grown bigger and stronger, realized our full potential, and be able, to come over, be able to overcome any hurdle. I'm only a child. At the moment, I'm still facing the Elite Four, 
But Pokemon has taught me one thing that I hope you can all carry to your graves and feel the same way. I want to be the very best, like no one ever was. Pokemon, Dark Magician, yeah. Um, next up, Olivia Marshall. Have you touched someone's heart today? I have. I nodded to that girl in the hallway that everyone ignores because they all seem to be deathly afraid of her. But I'm not. Have you touched someone's heart today? You should. Talk to that boy you like but are afraid to talk to because he's not liked by everyone because he's seen as an outcast. Smile to a stranger in the hall just to be nice so you can go home and say, I made a difference in that person's day. I made someone smile. It made someone feel important, even if just for a moment in time. Have you touched someone's heart today? You can. You will be able to say you did something kind, and the other will be able to say that someone talked to them. Make someone not feel invisible for once. Make someone feel wanted. Make someone feel loved. Make someone that's dying to come out of their shell, that's screaming at the top of their lungs, but no one's around to give a damn. Make them feel relieved to not have to hide anymore because you have reached down and told them that you're going to be there each time they fall to pick them back up again and start over. To listen each time they want to scream at the top of their lungs because no one else seems to care. Even if you don't know them well, that's okay. Take that risk and touch a stranger's heart before they walk past you and out of your life forever. I'm pretty sure I've touched someone's heart today. Have you? Next is Samantha Lehan. My poem is called For the People in My Life, the Good, the Bad, and the Non-Existing. For my friends, I apologize for not letting you copy off my homework, for not listening to your complaining about nothing, for listening to you talk about how amazing your relationship is or how stupid your boyfriend is being, for being annoyed by your every move, for being annoyed by your self-centered heart, I apologize for trying to have an actual conversation with you. For my popular peers, I apologize for never being good enough for you, never pretty enough, only smart when I get things correct, but somehow I'm an overachiever. I apologize for not having more to offer to you. For my old Springfield classmates, I apologize for never being cool enough, for being the awkward new kid. I apologize for getting a haircut that looks like a boy because I kept getting lice from you. For my friends, I apologize for never being the friend I would want to be with, for being annoying, for being too loud, but somehow you still want to be friends. I don't apologize for that. For my sister, I apologize for our new family never being good enough for you, for not talking to you after all these years, but I have to admit, I shouldn't be the one apologizing. For my dad, I apologize for never being thankful enough for all that you do for me. I apologize for never wanting to let go of you when we hug, because I fear that it might be the last. I apologize for using you as my vent, especially when I'm supposed to be going to bed. I apologize for having an indecisive mind, for having you help me decide everything from what I should wear and wearing the opposite to what I should eat. I apologize for making you hold everything that I could just put down on the counter. I apologize for all the frustration I have caused you, from bugging you too much to all my nighttime rituals. I apologize for my laziness and the OCD that contradicts it. But what I don't apologize for is that you married Margie and for you for making me happy. 
For my mother, I apologize for not remembering, for not being able to picture your face, for not being able to understand. I apologize for not knowing, for taking your presence for granted. I apologize for taking a piece of gum on that night long ago when you told me not to. It has haunted my thoughts ever since. I apologize for not having you in my thoughts more, but they make me sad. I apologize for never visiting, even though Dad says we will. Lastly, I apologize for never saying goodbye, because I didn't know at the time. Our next poet is Galit Sarvet. Her daddy gave her pink shoes with red laces and said, baby, if you ever need to go somewhere, these shoes can take you places. But where does a little girl go when she can't tie her own laces? Tugging and pulling, finally defeated, she says, well, these shoes can't take me places. I'll use Velcro instead. But that night, she'd still be dreaming about tying her laces. But in her dream, she could fly and never needed to learn. The seeing were never blinded, and there were no hidden corners to turn. With her dreams in the palms of her hands and Velcro to use, one morning she woke up not quite fitting in those shoes. That day she felt like her toes were beginning to bruise, but oh, if only her dreams could fit in the palms of her hands and she in her shoes, she might still be that little girl her parents were so reluctant to lose. Footloose she followed, chalk line arrows on the move, hopscotch lines running over rubbish, smoked cigarettes, and gum already chewed. These are the directions she almost had to choose, the chalk line arrows that masked the abandoned and the used that sometimes faded and made her swerve, but she's got nothing to lose. Soon she found new shoes to fit her soles, and with her soul she flew. Might say she's going places. Yeah, I could name a few. Next poet is Josh Whitman. Up until this morning, I was planning on reading a very, let's say, different poem. But, sadly, that was declined this morning. So I'm going to read a different one. I call this poem, I'm sorry, my pencil, for it deserves an apology. I apologize, my little wooden pal, for you have worked without end. You are meant for great things, but you are being forced to write this poem. Meaningless and unfulfilling, you must be truly depressed. I'm sorry for forcing you to endure the crushing force of my fat fingers. I'm sorry for forcing you to wear that ridiculous hat atop your head, for you have no connected eraser. And I'm sorry for sticking you in between razor blades whenever you do get dull. But most of all, I'm sorry that you are number two, when in my eyes, you are number one. <laughs> The next slammer is last year's winner, the magnificent Melanie Tan. Way to make me sound way more important than I actually am, Juge. <laughs> 
Anyways, um, I've been doing the Poetry Slam for a while, and it's such a rewarding experience. I really, um, <laughs> I don't think I could be the same person if I hadn't done it. So this is, since it's my senior year, this is kind of my last hurrah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here, and here we go. I got down with the elements, swung off all the parapets. They don't see me coming because they ain't seen nothing yet. Not saying that I'm heaven sent, but man, I'm pretty close. Don't know what you're messing with. This is my creation myth. I rose up from primordial ooze, shook myself off, lost everything I had to lose. And I think I might believe in God, but I got a right to choose my own fate, my own path. I'm making my own shoes instead of filling them. But I was not always the substanding individual. Fact, any pride I have is mostly residual. My existence on this earth is somewhat parenthetical, and any glory I could gain was mostly hypothetical. But I chose it, and I chased it, and I spent a lifetime running after an impossible dream that my parents were gunning for, and I never stopped, it was my own violation, that I never wondered why they never asked my permission. My life in their hands, my kingdom for a thought. I tore myself to pieces that I was doing what he ought and I did. Well, for a while, I was walking on air. Man, I was golden, scot-free, without a care. The whoops, the gold's gravity. Oh, ain't that a tragedy? I'm gripping, I'm gripping, but man, I'm slipping, I'm slipping. Don't let me go, don't you dare let me go. I got everything to prove and I got nothing to show for it. I crashed and I burned. I fell harder and harder. I want to pick myself up. I was back where I started. Yeah, man, got the bruises of a martyr. Sacrificing life just to get my race charted. My parents dreamed of six-figure paychecks with their money on my coat hook, but got mediocre suit and writing poems in their notebook. When report cards came in, I was told them don't look, because I was scared that I wasn't good enough. Every night I'd say, please, oh please, powers that be, let me do my best to make them proud of me. That was my only way of life, a faux joie de vie, to hear them say that's her daughter. Melanie, that's how I lived every day, barely breathing, bogged down by expectations I was meant to exceed in the weight on my shoulders was too much to bear, and it got to a point where I just didn't care about myself anymore. Good enough. I'm good enough. See? I'm doing this for you, and I only live to please. I placed my self-worth into the hands of others, engaged myself by the approval of mothers. But is that any way to live? That's what I thought, yo. And it took me so long to learn how to let go. It took me a while to get all my thoughts clicking in place on the page, all covered in big pens. I found a groove and settled in. My head, oh, it's spinning. This is where I belong, and my ears are ringing. This is wrong, this is wrong. You shouldn't be here. It's eating me up, manifestation of my fear. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can see, but up here I'm quaking. It's taken me so long to realize I've been faking, never gonna be on an honor roll. Never was, and I'd be lying if I said math ever made my mind buzz. Synapses, they fire with words like this woven. These, these words are my scripture, this fate I have chosen, and I'm begging you, begging you to bend towards and listen. Feel free to call and judge and trust in your own discretion when I say we are all gods. We make this world and we can break it. This universe is our own, and we can create it. The writers, the painters, the scientists, all, we're all a part of this earth, this great floating ball of rock and water. Life is what you make it, and all I ask of you is to go ahead and take it. Take it in your own hands. Bend it to your will. It's, there are no limits if you only believe that it's real. And as much as we think of ourselves, we aren't born permanent. That's only true if we work hard and invest in it. The beauty of humanity, we're all one but not. We're all a part of this huge, gigantic global melting pot. We have the power to make this world beautiful, and if you haven't figured it out yet, well, I hope you soon will. And you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Remember to take your daily doses of humility. Your hands are your tools, but your voice can be a weapon. And as much as we build, we do almost double and reckon. We're a team like blocks. We build each other up, and yet we tear each other down despite our rose tinted cover up. So I stand here on the stage, begging you to listen, to put down your firearms, lower your verbal missiles, and use that same power to make this world serene. You, um, just listen, listen and picture this scene. You, me, us, sitting in harmony. This is my creation myth, but what will yours be? Thank you. This is called Wolf It Down, okay? Oh, the big bad wolf stared down the hill. He was feeling kind of sick. He was feeling kind of ill. What's our pun, said his wife. You ain't looking so good for huffing, puffing, blowing down the hood. Oh, his brains were leaking and his bones were creaking. 
His body was a shaking and his guts were aching. Feel bad for you, babe, but I know what's wrong. Dig. You've been eating too much of that old pig. You got to admit that from here to New York, you've been eating way too much of that Puerto Rican roast pork. Tell you, honey, that's the deal. You are overloaded on pernil. I know, gooned Wolfie, I can't deny it. Well, I think I'll put you on a vegetarian diet. Wolfie growled, if nature wanted me to do the lettuce habit, the fair gods and goddesses would have made me a rabbit. Try it, honey, try it, please, she said, rolling up her sleeves. Came home from the market with some fresh split peas, oatmeal, kale, and cottage cheese, Brussels sprouts, whole wheat grains, apple spinach, and some fresh plantains. Let's start with some lentil stew and roast endives. You think that shive's going to keep me alive? Have some of this fake meat, good Satan. Ah! It tastes like marinated rubber bands. Honey, it's protein substitute made from soybean. I don't know, but it's making my muzzle turn green. Give me something halfway nice. So she cooked him some beans and some rice. That's better, I can live with that. But my belly is a aching for some bacon fat. <laughs> Try this, it was a plate of tofu and mung bean sprouts. He took one bite and he spat it out. <laughs> he fell to the floor. On all four paws, began to bleat, entreat, implore. I beg you, baby, really, my sweet, I'm just a dude who needs his meat. I need rib, steak, leg of lamb, some chitlins, a whole baked ham. I need the chops, shoulders, oxtails, pig's feet. I'm just a frickin' wolf, and I need my meat. I'm a telling you, he screamed with a roar. I'm just a hardcore carnivore. So he rushed from the house, blowing his top, ran all the way to stop and shop, through the workers and the bosses, the security heat, till he got to the section with the big label, meat. And he ate the ribs and the shoulders and the butts. Nothing was ha happening, only was left nuts. So the moral of the story, you got to be yourself, even if you grab the last can of Spam off the shelf. Thank you. Up next, we have an amazing poet, the very own Asher Griska. Back in the day, I was the smiling champion of Northampton. My lips always spread from cheek to cheek, a dentist's dream. But in the modern age, I find it harder to smile, and let me tell you why. If you casually flip through a magazine, chances are the advertisements you see will have some hunky non-smiler staring into your soul. I wish these guys would have some expression, but I have to hand it to them. They look very cool. This is why smiling is so hard. It can no longer be classified as the coolest facial expression. Like I said, these guys look very cool. I try to be like them, but I just can't. I like smiling. So I've decided to compromise. Today, you will witness, as I blend, the casual cool scowl with a big goofy grin to unify these two expressions into one face. First, I'll think about putting on socks. Socks are comfy smile. 
Then I'll imagine I'm only wearing one, which would be weird and kind of uncomfortable. At least one of my feet would still be cozy. Scowl. Next, I'll think about eating fast food. Smile, but not so fast. It's pretty bad for you. That's a smaller smile. Then I'll think about vacation. Smile. And then the end of vacation. That's scowl. <laughs> then I'll think about the future, which will confuse me, so I'll stop. And as a sign of relief, I'll smile a little bit. And we made it. This is the face. <laughs> Someday soon, you will be flipping through a magazine in a cool way, and you will see an advertisement. Grayscale, abdominal muscles, nature. And in the center of the page, bold as day, strutting across the lower facial region of the model with an unmatched swagger, a glorious half smile. A half smile reaching out to hold your heart. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs>We stopped checking for monsters under our bed when we realized they're in our head, keeping us up with these fake thoughts, telling us we're too fat, not good enough, and not hot, telling us to slit our wrists, making us believe we're not worth it. Just like the rest of the world, telling all the beautiful girls with subliminal messages they're too big because they actually have a set of hips, letting everyone fall short of their potential, Trapping people with mental abuse. Don't put the gun to your head, only shoot for the stars, kid. Telling us we're just basic and we're the equivalent to a waste of space. The world to me has no taste. I'll tell you what, if you would kill to look better naked, have sex with the lights off. If you feel you need makeup to look pretty, then pile it on soft. Because the more you fake, the more real is lost. You put on a good show, a great laugh, a good smile. Truth is, fake only lasts for a while. You put on and put on all of these things, you're destroying your true beauty. Can't you see what I see? Fake friends, fake feelings, fake memories, stop with all the faking. You put on a good show, a great laugh, a good smile, but truth is, in the end, fake is a waste that only lasts for a while. So come on, cover boys and cover girls, the show is over, take it off, because the more you fake, the more real is lost. Don't you see what fake costs? And such a big price when it only lasts for a while, but when you're real, there is no need to fake. And sure, time it may take, but in the end, you'll have a real life, a real laugh, a real smile. So give it a rest, the show is over, what's done is done. When you're real, the world is lots of fun. Give being real a world, and you'll see there's no need to cover up, cover boys, and cover girls. Next up, we have Amy Glenowix. A porcelain blue vase turned upside down with a shatter and a pile of broken glass. Flashbacks. It makes me sad to remember, but there are parts I couldn't forget. Soft-spoken words that we shared that night. Laying in our beds, cold sheets, and the heat turned up. The closet door cracked, light dimmed. Foggy memories that seemed so distant. Staying up late just because we were told not to, so it made us feel sneaky. Staring at glow-in-the-dark stars on the ceiling. We would talk about art we made that day, and secrets would slip out of our mouths. Not always having to second-guess what we say. It all seemed easy. I guess you could say happier days. We had a lot of time and didn't have to worry about what was always happening next. A time of no regrets. Laying down still couldn't block out the sounds. Even when there were stars in the sky. Unhappy, angry, unclear words. 
They muttered them, but we still had ears. At the time, we weren't aware, and we had dreams. No one would dare to tell two little girls that life wasn't like how it was in fairy tales, and no one was going to come save us. I guess when you're young, you don't realize how fast time slips away. I wish I could grasp it, hold it at my fingertips, and watch it as it slips away like sands through the cracks of my fingers. I know everyone does it at some point, going back to childhood and wondering when it sunk in, when you realize that magic wasn't real and trust was hard to find, wondering if the person that's been taking up space in your head ever thinks of you at night, when in reality you know they're moving on instead. Bittersweet tears that now stain my pillowcase. There are people I miss who say they miss me back, but it's hard to know if it's all just an act because I see them and they're changed, someone far from who we used to be. I think when we were close and when I really knew them, I don't know if they really knew me. And next up we have Joel McGoslin, who I think wrote his on a typewriter. That takes dedication. All right, come on up here, Joel. I appreciate the polite clapping, even though barely any of you know who I am. Thank you. The title of this poem is, Oh God, Not Another One. I can't think. I can't breathe. I'm not a poet. I'm just self-centered. I once met a woman on a dimly lit curb. She did not know the way to the hotel, but she knew all about the cruel ways of the world. I don't know what to say. I don't know why I'm here. Everything's flashing before my eyes. Coffee rings on the table and a sky revealing 3% of the universe. I once saw a dog of dusk and dusk sniffing a pile of red meat that would make your teeth sink into themselves. He did not know the way to the sun's heart, but he knew how to walk on three legs. I can't focus. I can't. I can't. Phone calls and long walks and smoke blowing from chapped lips. I'm slipping. I once met a bird perched lazily in a cat's mouth. She could not answer my questions, for she had forgotten how to speak. Spilt wine and good morning smiles and show tunes in the evening and ice cream. There was lots of ice cream. I once saw a glass stowaway blending in perfectly with the blood roses and the raw lust. He did not know of a way to get to water, but he showed me how to lose myself in my thoughts. Oh God, oh God, they're checking the time. I need to finish raw fish and, and broken pay phones and, and cute, cute Domino's employees. I once saw Buddy Holly flipping burgers at McDonald's. I asked him if he died in a plane crash and he said that he did. He was just tired of being remembered that way. Before we announce the next poet, I'd just like to say we're very glad to see the enthusiasm in the freshman class this year, so give them a hand. <laughs> but our next poet is Nate Diaz. So, Nate Diaz. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kinda scared, you know, I am. He gets out the car to walk to Charles Park for a bad habit break in the AM. He takes the fire from his pocket to light his intoxicating cancer stick. As he is taking a drag off of it, he feels the footsteps of someone or something that isn't too usual. His heart is pounding as the footsteps get closer. 
Then as he is inhaling his death contraption, it hits him. It wasn't no one ordinary. It was his ELA teacher from the second floor. <laughs> She's probably thinking so young, he's starting off his life on the wrong track. He's probably thinking she's just trying to get on his case. But what he doesn't know is what if she's just trying to help the youngster out to get out that life. But he can't, he tries. But his life is so stressful that he chooses to kill himself little by little instead of telling someone how he feels, hopeless. The feeling of smoke relieving his body is nothing good, but it reveals the stress, the stress of waking up late, stress of feeling like you're in a hopeless box waiting to get out, but not knowing the way out. That's the killer. Our next poet is Norma Jean Haynes. From this moment on, I am courageous. No longer a swirly girl in a flowery shirt, no longer just a slip of curliness hiding in corners, no longer a small thing. When the quiet seeped around me like a bubble bath popped at my ears with a million voices squawking, they would have said hello, but I was young to do the math and too shy to do the talking. And the silence grew like shadows up your street while we were walking, and I was like a robin, silent, flitting, fluttering. I always thought affection was embarrassing, but from this moment when I take your hand in mine in public, I am courageous. And I used to worry that my brain pulled you out from under my eyelids while I was sleeping, so that each tear you shed was my eye weeping, and your smile was something that I made up for myself. There was no reason possible I could see that you would love a person lost, exhausted, and serious, a brittle twig about to snap. But it's time to nestle sadness on its shelf. I am ready to make a fool out of myself. It, this moment is my start. This is my migration, so stop calling me serious, like the pointed accusation. Touch my hair if you dare. I'm not going anywhere. I've spent a lifetime building fairy houses and telling myself lies, telling myself I was blue as the sky because I sang the blues under my breath. But never have I ever been so majestic or resplendent as the sky, only bitterly, silently shy. And I have had beautiful times with my shyness. In the summer, at the beach with the sand eating our feet, up late at night whispering, with popcorn stuck in our teeth, that's done now. I have buried my shyness in a darling Clementine box. She is buried under 16 years of, of thoughts. And she went slowly and she went soft the moment I found my voice. And it is quiet, but it's not contemplation. It is a gloria. It is an exaltation. It is a thank you. Thank you, human race, for giving me these hands to hold and a funny, freckled kind of courage. You can see it in my eyes when I look up to the stars popping and fizzing out in the sky and the geese flying two inches from the moon. My courage is with those geese. My heart is with them, too. Now I am rising up. Now I hold my breath and run. Now I am rising up like the rich egg yolk of sun. And the exhales of gold that I leave in the sky will be my bravery, a freedom from slavery, and a struggle with a silence evaporating. So take my hand if you can. I will tell you my plan. Honest, fearless courage. <laughs> Next up, we have the nicest man in the world, Jasmeet Singh. So. Oh, 
Fear runs through the world's veins. It runs through the people's minds. Like a river flow of a waterfall, the fall could come immediately, or it may feel like it never will. But the uncertainty is the actual waterfall, occurring in one's mind almost every second. It's the fear of the unknown. In the world now, the uncertainty not only comes as fear, but pain as well. The pain of uncertainty compels us to be prepared, brutal and ruthless, not for the death of ourselves, but for the death of others. One's beautiful rainy day or sunny sky may quickly become a fiery pit full of agony and slow death. Driving the fears to levels unimaginable is the uncertainty of death itself. The one thing we probably don't want to happen to us becomes our method to protect ourselves against others. I don't know how we, uh, we may gain the trust of others when they fear us, or how we may do so with the same perspective, but seeing those who take the risk and make the sacrifice, not for being better than the other, is what makes me feel strong about a future safe and happy together. All right, up next is Danny Loriana. All right, so this is poem is called If Only I Could. <clears throat> if only I could see your face, we could travel to another place. Fill the wishes, hopes, magic, and dreams, happiness bursting at the seams. If only I could hear your voice, the two of us could make a choice, to sit up all night till the break of dawn, talking endlessly, on and on. If only I could touch your hand, we could walk on water and swim on land. Our fingers would be intertwined, and you and I would be combined. If only I could smell your clothes, feeling the shocks print into my toes. You'd smile at me and kiss my cheek, making my legs feel shaky and weak. If only I could taste your tears, holding you close, away from your fears. Your hands would hold on to mine, and I'd whisper, you'll be just fine. If only I could stop reading the stone that makes me feel so very alone. That truthful stone will break me till the end. Here lies him, son, brother, and friend. The next poet is Angela Sewell. You are immature. I'm your child. You are not mine, and by God, you need to grow up. You need to stop blaming me for things out of my control and get angrier still when I express my pain the only way I know how. I understand that you get stressed. I just wish that you could understand that my feelings are just as real as yours. You are immature. I am your friend, not your therapist. Yes, I wouldn't mind hearing of your troubles if only they weren't so childish. You, too, need to grow up. Take a look at the everlasting scars on my arm, a constant reminder of the past I continuously carry, and tell me that your problems are so big. Just look, I dare you. You are immature. All you do is point out my flaws as if you had none yourself. You need to wake up. You are only as flawless as I, as anyone in this room, as anyone on this whole damned earth. And I am just as human as any of you. And I am flawed, but I am beautiful too and I can shine brighter than any star in the heavens or any j polished gemstone you can dig out of the dirt. But you, you are immature. All right. Our next poet is Unza Butt.
Hi. All right. I call this one beautiful. Every day I wake up to a beautiful world. This beautiful life with many beautiful girls. Beautiful people doing beautiful things. And I walk around amazed at this beautiful brings and I smile. I look up and I smile at the sky. I see others smiling too as they pass me by and realize that this life is too short to stress. And so laugh, my friends, and just live at the best because you're beautiful. Even if you don't think it's true, you are. Your beauty is hidden inside you. The human eyes are blind to what the heart can see. And when I look from the heart, everyone to me is beautiful. No matter what your color of skin, all that matters is the soul and their heart within. So live, my friends. Laugh and smile as you do. Be yourself inside. Keep a beautiful you. And every day when you wake up and you look at yourself, realize, my friends, that you're beautiful too. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, everybody, give it up for Satchel Davis Delano. I apologize for my jeans, they make my feet a different size. I've always played soccer, although to say I'm good would be lies. I apologize for my growth, I needed some new cleats. I apologize that I came to your store, actually getting out to go shopping is a feat. I apologize for liking the black ones with white stripe. The others were too fast, flashy, just not my type. I apologize for asking the eight, they worked on my left, the other was too tight. I asked for another pair, the eight and a half fit on my right. I apologize for switching them out so they fit just right. I apologize for being rude. I guess it wasn't polite. Thanks. And next, if everyone is ready, we have the Miss the amazing Miss Emma Carr, right here. So I'm really hoping to get this first line right, because I'm a senior and this is my last year to actually slam a poem instead of write it. It's not me, it's my brain. Blame it, not me. No, we are not the same entity. If we were, we would get along. As it were, we do not. My brain is evil. It is sadistic, possibly hyperactive, most definitely psychotic, and I think it stole my to-do list. Basically, my brain is a jackass, and I do not think it thinks very highly of me. In fact, I know it doesn't. If my brain thought fondly of me, then it would not. Wander when I have to work, fidget when I wish to think, and if my brain gave a damn, it would not throw its version of a frat party in the middle of the bloody night whilst I am trying to sleep. Seriously? Were it that my brain meant well, it would not blurt out random thoughts that honestly have nothing to do with the topic at hand, instead of maybe suggesting something witty or funny or even borderline clever for me to say, though I probably wouldn't listen anyway. But that's only because when I do, I end up sounding like a basket case. I'm not kidding. Assuming my brain cared, then, I would, then it would most definitely not focus on the mistakes, mix-ups, goof-ups, and or various unpleasant screw-ups that, though I repeatedly shred, burn, and delete, it still manages to remember. I think it's got a hidden file somewhere. If my brain wished me well, it would remember what my friend asked me and not the line from Legally Blonde 1 concerning perms or that section from Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis that I never meant to remember but can recite on cue by accident. And by the way, as a side note, can I just ask, why a love poem? In my life, I have heard hundreds of poems, thousands perhaps. So why, why brain, why, why this one? Do you know how awkward it is when, after telling people this, something a well-meaning brain would likely advise me against, they ask you to recite it? Come on, what am I supposed to say? Hey, my lips aren't as pretty as yours, but I'm really enthusiastic. This ground, that eyeballs, make out with me. Okay, good to see you, you're not gonna go. By the way, do you have those math notes? That's awkward. So see, my brain is vindictive, and it quite clearly has it out for me. It does not like me. It cannot like me. If it liked me at all, it would not focus on pomegranates instead of Puritans, rivers instead of rhetoric, socks instead of storylines, food instead of facts, bubbles instead of Brennan, 
or the color blue instead of the causes, complaints, and contributing factors, as well as the major figures, dates, and occurrences that led up to and further fueled the catastrophic conflict that was the French floor. Oh, hey, look, marbles. I thought I lost those. To reiterate, my brain is a jackass, and you should not blame me for what it does. Next up is Matt Wood. Um, I made this poem at like 2 in the morning when I couldn't sleep, and I was really angry, so it is going to have some censorship. So... It's, um... It's uh, sort of about how society's sort of going downhill. But, uh, <laughs> so, he's given me that sad look of disapproval. So what if I came to this library to not read a book and use some Wi-Fi and play a game or two? He can go read his book on the other side of the room and keep his thoughts to himself. I don't want any of this. Back in my day, we were playing hockey with the two sticks and a rock. Bullshit! <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> Tried it. Looks like a little pack of dumb <laughs> hitting the ground with some sticks, and all we accomplished was breaking an ankle or two. So he can sit there and read his Daily Hampshire Gazette while I'm over here reading the like, screen of my Pokemon and my Zelda, and he can keep his thoughts to himself. Maybe he thinks we should be out oh, reading books and these video games are harming our minds, and he might have a point, but it's too late now. There's no turning back. It's the age of the Xbox and the PlayStation, and that's the way it is. So maybe he thinks I should go read a book. And in a world of nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds shooting people in rated M games, sounds like a good idea. But try telling them that. They're going out, going, hey, mom, can I go buy this game? And they're like, sure. They don't know better. Don't blame them. It could be the parents. They don't care. They're <laughs> they don't care what their kid's doing. If your kid came up to you and went, hey, can I have some cocaine? Would you just say yes? Because that's what they're doing. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, <laughs> that's what these parents are doing. They're letting their, so these nine-year-olds are out there swearing and screaming at the world. It just doesn't work at all. So, <laughs> we're, the world is screwed. Because these kids are going to be parents. And what will they be like if they grew up spending 12 hours straight in front of a TV shooting people? these kids are the future of America. How does that make you feel? Watch out, I'm coming. Next up we have Jenica Haining. Excuse me, miss. I'm afraid you must apologize, for you see, you broke that poor girl's heart. Your words, your stinging words, they ripped a crack through her life, as if there weren't enough already. Oh, I should apologize for my just words, for the truth I speak? Okay, then, let me apologize. Let us see how you handle lies rather than truth. I apologize, then, for my actions, for my idea to protect those you hurt, for the wrong thought to say nice things rather than hurtful statements. I apologize for my defiance. You think you... You who think you're so queenly that everyone must bow. I don't mean to be the very opposite, to be kind and friendly, to build my self-confidence by building up those around me. Oh wait, I do. So then I will say once more, you must apologize, you see, for your demand to be above, for your goal to degrade those around you, for your breaking of innocent spirits. You who must rule, you who must be so much better. Shame, you see. Shame that you must destroy others to build a false life. So I will bow to you, queen. Good job, I applaud you who are so skilled. Oh, how sad I must feel for being so different. Oh, how secluded I feel in my circle of true friends. 
but no matter how I feel, do not be mistaken. I will not apologize. If I will not do so, so you see, you must apologize. All right, and now we have Ethan Duval. call this the martyr. I've been thoughtful. I've been caring. I dared to speak of what others have only dreamed of. But did you know that I have dreams of my own? When I close my eyes, dark darkness surrounds me. A whole new world appears before me where our blood is equal. If dreaming is heresy, then punish me for my acts. In my life, I've seen numerous acts of affection and the utmost barbarity. They say when tyrants have no, no room for love, they find anger and replacement. What happened to you? Are you scared of change? Are you scared of those who are different? I've realized I am different from you and from everyone else. I have known the passion of an elder who accepted me for who I am, who raised me to stand up for myself. I've known the compassion of a mother and watched it vanish as her disciple rose up against her being. My feelings are indescribable. None of you will ever know. I express myself with art upon my body, representing the story in each work. And you, you treat me as if I'm a mutant. You don't accept me for the way I am, nor the way I look. My blood trickles down my arms as you crucified me to this cross. There is no use in hiding from all of you, and you might see who I am. I'm the subordinate, the silence, the martyr. My blood illuminates brightly for all of you to see. This blood is the flame of a brand new world that you will never ever be able to suppress. My being can be erased for all eternity, but my sentiments will never die. You're nothing but a tyrant, an ill being thinking that you can do anything you want to, but I'm angry because I trusted you. All I wanted was to be accepted like the world in my dreams, where everyone works together. Next is Emily Tan, the Eliminator. Sister Mel wanted me to be a rapper like her, but I chose spoken word, I guess. Shut up. <laughs> hear it. Don't you hear what they're saying about you? Freak, weirdo, creep. Don't know martial arts, can't use chopsticks. Making all these assumptions about the color of my skin, like what my knowledge is of my culture, when I know how it's thin, I can't take it anymore. The talking, the whispers make me want to rip away my jaw and chin. My breath is short, heart pounding like crazy, the adrenaline is pumping through the veins of my body. I can't control it, the lies and the slander, making me want to scream, everyone be quiet! 
I'm making out my hair strands coming out in clumps. I'm wild and anxious, down with the mumps. I hate everything and nothing, everyone myself, feeling like every fiber of my being is being consumed in the color of society's conglomerated disgust and lust. Is it hate or is it kindness? The lines are all blurred. I'm surrounded by faces looking at me like I'm absurd. I felt like I'm at war with the recesses of my body. I want to tear myself down and build me back up. I don't understand the way they all see. Putting me in the pedestal that I don't need, I'm never going to be my sisters. Seeing others think that makes me sick. I'm no carbon copy, no government-made clones stuff with the labels and putting us on thrones. We're no glorified porcelain dolls. We're not stained glass. Stop putting... Stop displaying us in cases. Stop judging my social class. No one wants to be degraded, but I'm sure as can be. We aren't all the same. We have different family situations. Some of us don't get past graduation. We all come in different ways, different sensations. I want to make my parents proud of me. Show them their daughter's the best she can be in, no matter how many times she lay awake thinking about all the times she's been wondering about leaving the life she's had so far. And finally show them all her scars, physical and mental, emotion and pure skin. She's sick and tired of the world they're forced to live in. She wants to scream and shout. The words aren't coming out. She wants to live and die. She wants to laugh and cry. She can't make, she can't make the decision. Punch the wall. Ha. Punch the wall is a cut with total precision. She stands, surrounded and cornered, feet planted to the floor. Arms are tired, knees are weak. She wants to scream, but she cannot speak. Um, so we finished the student portion of the Poetry Slam, and now we have some special guests. Um, first up is our alumni, Chris Gonzalez. Did you guys have a good day? You had a nice time? Clap, clap, clap. Keep clapping for everybody who ran. It was. I'd like to dedicate this poem to a very close friend of mine who's in the audience who I never get to read for, Mr. Harp. Um, if you guys, uh, I've, I'm very happy. If you want good poetry, talk to him about the Fujis. Have him tell you. Good music, because that's what he did for me. Changed my life, so here we go. I once stumbled through a jungle in the rain with the same gun Sigmund Freud once pointed at his brain. I shot at giant trees so I could hear the leaves sing, but all I heard was a bunch of birds sleeping. I once stumbled through a jungle in the rain Tripping over roots, veins reaching deep, glowing green aurora, and the horror of seeking silence is sadly, you may find it. Again, the horror of seeking silence is sadly, you may find it. And honestly, this never happened, but truthfully it did. I didn't know what I was after, but it was elusive and it hid. I set traps to catch a beast and pierce a blade through its ribs. I wanted to choke it and strangle it till it struggled to live, and then breathe it deep into me and kiss it on its lips. My own magnum opus, a hopeless vision of objective truth that has propelled me lifetime after lifetime in pursuit through waking states of sleeping solitude like solemn nights spent stones skipping stones across the lake at Sleepy Hollow, doing drugs today for parties tomorrow and parties that follow with a ghostly halo of neuroses floating two inches above my head. I am Michael the Archangel. I am Goliath and Leviathan all compiled in one being and at any given moment I can't tell which one is speaking and it makes 
makes me nervous. It makes me nervous how words just surface and escape the jungles that keep them deep beneath them in slumber. I've stumbled in to free them. My pistols blaze through torrential rain where I struggle to aim at the fleeting streaks of genius sneaking through the trees only to go off and die unknown in their own cerebral bones. And that is why I hate being an artist. Marauding horsemen riding through the forest, each carried a steak knife in a blank canvas, asking me to shed some blood to share an image. I appreciated the selflessness involved, but now nah, I couldn't dig it, so I didn't. I just sat down drunk on a tree stump, wishing more distance between creation and destruction. And now I am in the perfected body of a deity, on the threshold and a thundering. I spit my shadow on the couch and count the angels who slit their wrists, insisting I exist only in non-dualistic states of sleep, or when the lights go out and the floorboards creak and the vines creep up my chest to grab hold my neck and bring me back to my goddamn roots. Thank you. Our next guest is Jarrell Watkins from Hampshire College. Yeah. Um, what can I say? I want to thank everyone, you know, for the amazing work y'all done, like, this past two months, I believe. And, like, I mean, I'm really loving the energy and the vibe. So just give yourselves a round of applause. So really, I did a great job. This one is called Float Away. I have held the railing on stairs since I was able to walk. Avoided all monkey bars and swings. Took extra so steps while walking across bridges. Prayed by riding inside elevators. I shut my eyes while climbing up ladders, refused to ride roller coasters. First impression of bungee jumping, simulated suicide, skydiving. Humans were not meant to fly. I can't even bring myself to fly on a plane. Not because I'm afraid of heights, but because I'm afraid of falling. I was told several months before I was born, my father pushed my mother down a flight of steps. You think that an accident during gestation would cause this fear? You'd be mistaken. I to see my mother drop from wife to trick, from trick to whore, from whore to crack it. I've been worried of being high. If you knew how long the drop was, you'd be afraid yourself. I saw a pipe lying on my mother's bed. The ground became gelatin. I sunk in denial, your watch and disbelief as my mother's soul arose like vines in mid springtime, only to fall as a dangling chestnut. As she hit the earth, her split open chest revealed a hardened core. As she took her lighter and gagged off her own smoke, my mother confessed to me that being buried to be her greatest high. I wear that moment like a nicotine patch, paste it on my shoulders, a chip. I dare someone to knock over, I dare someone to blow smoke in my face. I blow back my mother's gasp, exhale a wheezing cough, grief muffling. The help me climbing up her vocal cords, my mother attempted to fly but was only capable of skydiving. Her paper mache body descended like a collapsed roof, falling as if gravity had a grudge. Whether there be a crash or an easy landing is irrelevant. All that matters is how you get back up. Mother, please get back up. But this time, do not float away. Lungs were not designed to be parachutes. Thank you.
Next, we have Danielle Peterson. kind of tall. My name is Danielle Jefferson, not Peterson. <sighs> All right. How y'all doing? All right. So I'm kind of tired, y'all. It's finals week. I'm running on two hours of sleep for the past three days. So bear with me. <clears throat> Thank you, Jarrell. All right. So I have something new. I wrote this recently. So I didn't memorize it, so bear with me. I'm going to read it off my iPhone. <laughs> so I wrote this poem for my little seven-year-old cousin who came home one day and asked me why her hair was so ugly. How many of you have got your hair permed? Anybody? No? I see some boys raising their hands. Y'all perm your hair? Stop lying. All right. So. Um, just a little context so you understand what I'm saying in the poem. Do you guys know what lye is? L-Y-E. It's one of the ingredients in perm and relaxers. It's very bad for your hair. So I wrote this poem for her. Y'all ready? I can't hear you. All right. I, I have to feed off of your energy because I'm about to collapse up here. All right. <clears throat> Baby girl. You are only seven years old, with hair that learns lessons from the soil, running deep in richness, burning like the sun at its core. Roots so strong, built to withstand the nature of any force. But they are already being poisoned by this hot press machine, white lie relaxers selling you white women's dreams. Oiling your scalp with promises of achieving beauty that only leave you with broken ends and breaching duties. Duties that you have to yourself and your esteem. So I wrote this poem to remind you that you're a black queen. Baby girl, you are only seven years old. You don't know yet that what they televise is all telling lies and that white Barbie doll you've been playing with modeled after Eurocentric ideals got you running home to the mirror drowning in tears from blonde haired and blue eyed dreams. You don't know yet why you want so bad to untangle your roots. But it's because this world fears you and what you can do. You see, long before you were even conceived, colonizers in conquest enslaved black people and forced them to believe that the richness of their own soul wasn't worth keeping. And through hundreds of years, those lies began to seep in. And in fear and fascination, they condemned your beauty, teaching you not to love yourself. You were taught long ago to hate the texture of your hair and the ebony of your soul. You were tricked into trading those in because you were brainwashed into thinking that your beauty was something in need of fixing. They feared the empowered and engaged black woman and the power that she had, so they robbed you of your majesty and made you believe that your hair was bad. Baby girl, that hair of yours is your glory, and what they fear is what they can't have. I wrote this poem for my baby cousin who came home one day from school and looked up at me with eyes filled with what I knew to be the beginning of acceptance. Acceptance of the lies that they tell little black girls that their hair is anything less than beautiful. Take your throne and cast out every lie and every lie that has ever burned and attempted to untangle your roots. Be the champion of your darkness. Love yourself, love your hair, and love your roots. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we are sad but delighted. We have concluded the 15th Annual Poetry Slam. We need, shout it out, everybody. Woo! Thank you!